You, you can't nuke a network. How would you nuke Bitcoin? You would arm you. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. We're, we're recording this uh, a week or so before the, the biggest elections of our lives in the government of the United States of America, at least here in, uh, in California. It's a late evening, a week or so before the election. I'm talking today to a renowned uh, individual, a thinker, an engineer, a creator, sort of a philosopher, a guru to many around the world, maybe millions. And that's Balaji Srinivasan, Dr. Balaji Srinivasan. And we, uh, we, I think we barely may have overlapped. I was at Stanford. Uh, you were there for a very long time. Uh, maybe I'm a little bit older than you, but we definitely overlapped where we're from. We're both from Long Island. So I think that's yes. that's pretty that's cool. I'm, I'm actually from Suffolk County, though. So you're, you're from Nassau uh, County, if I understand yes, correctly. That's right. so. that's uh, but anyway, it's the longest island in America, at least. Maybe one of the longest islands in the world. We're going to get to the world. We're going to talk about a phenomenal new contribution to the world, uh, and that's uh, Balaji's newest book. So first of all, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's early where you are. It's late where I am. We'll turn up the Zoom, you know, tune up our appearances maximally. Uh, how are you doing today? Good. I'm doing great. Thanks for joining us. So as I mentioned, I always like to start off an interview with a renowned author such as yourself by doing that which you are never supposed to do, which is to judge a book by its cover. But Balaji, as you know, uh, what else do you have to go on when you see a new book? And all you have is cover and the author's name and the subtitle. So I thought sure. you'd start by uh, how did you come up with the name, the network state, the subtitle, the cover design, and uh, the overall gestalt of this uh, magnificent new book? Well, thanks. Um, appreciate it. Uh, yeah, so, um, you know, maybe you can put the cover just to my left or something while I'm talking about it. Yeah. Um, right. You know, the, the network state is a seemingly abstract concept that uh, one of the important things that we did is um, illustrate it like as visually as possible on the cover of the book and then later in uh, the network state in one image very early in the book in chapter one, like basically the, you know, uh, we did the network state in one sentence, then we get to network state in one image, basically it's two or three pages into the book for the ADD, okay? And uh, the, the reason for that is that something that's really abstract or difficult to grasp, often a you know, picture's worth a thousand words. And when you see essentially a social network with some sort of, um, moral value or, uh, you know, some belief that then holds territory around the world that's not contiguous in one place. That kind of illustrates what the network state is. And so what that cover illustrates are three different, you know, um, groups that, you know, represented by like a yin yang symbol and the Vitruvian symbol and the Bitcoin symbol that own different pieces of territory around the world but really their capital is in the cloud. And so, you know, they are, they have projections down onto the earth. They might have, you know, a million people in the cloud and a few thousand people at each node on the earth. So it might even be like a thousand to one ratio, but those nodes are actually quite important. And those people in the cloud, of course, are scattered all over the earth, but there's a few points of physical concentration. And the fact that those exist are actually very important. Um, because it means that it's not a purely digital thing. It does have a physicality to it. It's cloud first, land last, but not land never. And so the cover of the book is sort of a way of showing that poetically without, um, you know, all of the bells and whistles that you'd use to show it a little, with a little more, um, you know, granularity or operationally. And uh, then if you go to the network state in one image and you click on that image there, uh, or if you look at the GIF, uh, in that in that thing. That gives a more zoomed in view where now you're actually seeing a census and you're not just seeing that a social network is crowdfunding territory, but you're seeing more than the four nodes or three nodes that are shown on the cover of the book, you're seeing more like 50 nodes. And those 50 nodes around the world have between like a, a thousand to 10,000 people, or actually some go all the way down to one person, just somebody in their room or two, you know, you might, you might require a node to have at least two people, fine, okay? But, uh, you know, let's say it goes down uh, to two, but up to, you know, 20,000 people. And, uh, but then the, the whole thing sums to a million people around the world. And it sums to a certain number of square meters around the world. And it sums to a certain amount of annual income around the world if you take all the on-chain income. 
And then that second image, the network scene one image, just a few pages in, shows how you can build something that looks a lot like a state. It's got a population income and real estate footprint comparable to that of legacy states, but you're sewing together a piece of territory and population from around the world, much as Bitcoin was a decentralized currency, this is a recipe for a decentralized state, right? So that's what those early images on the cover and uh, in, in chapter one are meant to convey. Mm. Um, and I wonder if we could uh, immediately kind of get into the nuts and bolts of, of what a network actually is and the kind of, sure. as, as I understand, the fundamental, you know, kind of Newton's laws or Schrodinger equation of, uh, of sure. network behavior is Metcalfe's law. Uh, which which I kind of think about in many ways, but one is entropically and and how you percolate out you know sources on nodes and how those nodes feed together information and the fundamental unit of of information. I wonder if we could start by uh, sort of you know going back to to Bitcoin itself. It's obviously central. I mean, you play a huge role in the story of Bitcoin, uh, but uh, but I wonder. Uh, I've often wondered. I mean, there's nothing about Bitcoin that couldn't have been implemented. You know. 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Uh, why do you think it mm. took so long? I mean, I'm not diminishing Natoshi, you know, whatever, Satoshi's uh, role at all or any of your contributions, but fundamentally, it's it's a relatively simple uh, algorithm that, that's what gives it so much power. Why do you think it came about when it did? I guess that's a succinct way of asking this question. Why, why did it take so long or, or, or uh, maybe it wasn't so long from your perspective? Yeah, I mean... Um... So the thing is that certain things, you know, like for example, the hash functions that Satoshi used were not available, you know, 30 years ago, to my knowledge, like the elliptic curve work. And so he had to snap together stuff that was uh, like, if what was the exact date that SHA-256 was published? Um, 2001, One, I think, yeah. by mm -hmm. NSA, and then um, RipeMD, and there were predecessors, right? One twenty-eight, and it wasn't, you know, completely. Yeah, out. no, it's true. There were there were hash functions, and so like basically, um, I think there are a few things. First is remember, you you needed to have bandwidth suitable enough, and enough people who had computers that were permanently connected to the internet to host the Bitcoin blockchain, and um, you know, probably even in the year two thousand one, maybe you could have done that in academia. But at least the initial vision of lots of home computers doing that and being always online and synchronizing back and forth. I mean, peer-to-peer -peer networks, you know, he cites, he uses the term peer-to-peer -peer in the yeah. white paper, which had at the time fallen out of fashion. But right. like Kazaa and Skype yes. and so Skype, on, yeah. th they weren't like that old, right? Like Skype, you know, launched, I think, 2004, if I'm not yeah. mistaken, 2003, okay? Yeah. So it's like about five or six years after Skype. And then there's a financial crisis, which was the cultural trigger. Yeah. So you had to have P2P networking. You had to have SHA-256 or, or, or probably something. So at least that came out in 2001. It was relatively soon after all those pieces came together. But, you know, um, could it potentially have been done sooner? Maybe. The interesting thing is there wasn't, to my knowledge, a Leibniz to Satoshi's Newton. Mm -hmm. That say It's not like there was somebody who was putting those pieces together in quite that way at that time. And they just... You know, it's not like a theory, Ethereum is wonderful and it's amazing, but it's not like it shipped, you know, three months later with uh, a different notation, but the same concepts. Uh, it, it, you know, it was it was something where Satoshi genuinely pioneered this new thing that people really didn't get for a while mm -hmm. uh, because he started with different premises than the existing system. And so if you start with different premises, then you know, whatever you build from that, it's not obvious that it's going to actually be useful. Like, for example, if, if people are like, okay, we're into the concept of internal combustion engines and you build a better one, then it's very easily accepted that it's 10% right. better, you know, you know right. energy or something. When you're talking about a decentralized digital currency, it's not even obvious still to many people that they want that, right? Why wouldn't I just, you know, have the bank hold my money or the government hold my money? They don't understand the concept of digital property rights or what have you yet. And so it's still a non-obvious thing to many people. Um, but right. about, I don't know, I think about 50% of people get it thereabouts, uh, depending, uh, when I say 50%, um, there's hundreds of millions of people around the world who hold cryptocurrency. And then a large enough number of people now get it on some level that they at least understand 
why it's around. Let's put it like that, whether it's 50%, it's hundreds of millions of people. That's a better term for it. In absolute numbers, there's a large number of people who get it now at this point. So that's the, that's the answer to, uh, to you know, um, why didn't it happen sooner? Mm -hmm. I mean, we'll ask, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. You'd also asked earlier, like, why the term the network state? Um, yeah. And uh, that is just something where, you know, sometimes you name a book last or, you know, this is something where I, in a sense, I wrote the book in a few months. And in a sense, I wrote the book in several years because I'd been thinking about some of the concepts for a while. Mm -hmm. For example, one critical concept is uh, people don't just judge a book by its cover. They will often judge a book by its title. Yeah. You know, for example, yeah. how many people have read the end of history versus they've heard the title and a little quick summary and they argue with it based on their sort of compressed understanding. Right. That's not necessarily a completely wrong thing to do because that compressed thing, um, you know, is a summary. But what happens is, obviously, in a in a in a compressed summary, you can't answer every single critique and criticism and so on. And some people would, you know, say, "Oh, Fukuyama didn't consider this, this, and that. End of history is so stupid." And often he had entertained those counter arguments in the book, which you you cannot easily fit into. A sentence Time. or two, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. With that yeah. said, with that said, uh, a phrase travels right like uh, much much farther than a, a full book. So you have to kind of armor up that phrase and have it do as much work for you as possible. Just as an example, like um, why why do people call themselves democratic socialists? Okay, in their very limited space to kind of convey a message they use the very first word to say, no, no, no we're democratic socialists. Right. We're not like the communists who are undemocratic socialists, right? So they are intentionally using some very scarce, you know, verbal real estate to preempt right. the, the most, most significant, line. the most significant bit is carrying, doing a lot of the work in that sense, in that first. Doing yeah. a lot of the work. That's right. Because at the time, you know, like certainly the mid 20th century, that, you know, otherwise they'd be the undemocratic socialists, right? That's why other folks will call themselves, you know, like the Christian socialists. So we're not- Progressives, right. Progressives, right? And then you're regressive. Yeah, 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 exactly. But but like like if you say Christian socialists, some people would say that, right? Or liberation theology, you know, in South America. Well, we're not godless communists. We're godful communists. Right. Uh, you know? <laughs> and so 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 often that, that word is chosen in such a way as to sort of embrace the fact that people will often just engage with the phrase. Hey friends, just a quick request while you're enjoying this video to leave a thumbs up. My thumb's a little bit preoccupied with all Carl Sagan over here, but I hope yours is free enough to leave a like. It really helps me with the algorithm. And for extra credit homework assignment, leave a comment down below what you're enjoying about this video. Now back to the show. And um, network state, you can get a lot out of just the phrase. First is network replaces nation. And so it sounds, it starts with an N. That's just like a small thing, but it's just like helps fit in the brain in the same way, right? Second is the network actually, if you read the book, there's like four definitions of network state that are interesting. The first is the network is actually the people. And, you know, the nation and the state are different. Um, you know, a nation, it's like shared birth, shared, you know, shared descent, like the same uh, root word in Latin is like natality, right? So mm -hmm. Nazis, I think. Birth. And um Whereas the state is an administrative layer above that people. So the nation, the, the nation is the people, the state is the management. It's like labor and, and management in a factory. They're actually quite distinct, okay? Mm -hmm. And so you could have the Japanese nation and the American state over it. You could have the, the Kurdish nation and the Turkish state over it, or the Catalonian nation and the Spanish state over it. And those are different, okay? And um, the, or you could have the Japanese nation and the Japanese state, and the Japanese state is just a subset of those Japanese people, and a totally different subset would result in a very different kind of state, right? Once you realize those are separable, which is not obvious because you usually hear them as a compound term, um, then you're like, okay, how can we separate and then recombine in a different way? A network state is one where the network replaces the nation, and now it's not necessarily common descent or common physical location for hundreds or thousands of years, but it's a proposition nation. Mm. It's a, it's literally a nation of shared belief, and uh, but that's a network today because those f folks are online. So the first way is you swap in the network for the nation. The second is the network because it's on computers, it's logic, it's code, is the state itself. So network state 
is a way of talking about a state that is governed by the rules of the network, such as, um, you know, law is code, right? Like the, you know, the whole um, uh, Larry Lessig uh, concept, right? So the state, the governance is now digital, right? Yeah. A third is when you talk about a state, usually people are thinking about something that's got physical terrain that it controls, right? And in the network state, um, it does have physical terrain that it controls, but that physical terrain is a network around the world. Uh, it's a physical network. It's little pockets, just like on the, the book's cover, as we were just talking yeah. about. Um, so the land of the network state is a network, okay? Mm -hmm. And the fourth and perhaps most abstract definition is in the book I talk about like God state and network as these three Leviathans that people are essentially implicitly invoke on a daily basis. Like they live their lives. They often don't think of this explicitly, but it's like, you know, who is the strongest force in their life? Is it mm -hmm. almighty God, right? Is it the U S military yep. or is it encryption? You know, mm -hmm. what is it that stops you from stealing in the 1800s? It's because you, you thought you got, you know, hit by a lightning bolt. You get smoked by God. If you, if you stole, 1900s, you might not believe in God, but the boys in blue are there. They're th throwing you in jail. The state will punish you, right? And the 2000s on the computer network where there is no obvious God and there is no state, right? It's the network that, will, that will, uh, won't let you steal. Either the social network will swarm you or the encrypted network or the encryption will, will stop you from transferring the funds. And what I mean by that is if somebody steals your cryptocurrency and you're in Idaho, and they're in, you know, um, Eastern Europe or something like that, to go to the Idaho Police Department and file a case, that's no longer a geographical thing. The, the state is as powerless there, relatively speaking. I mean, maybe you can try and get the FBI or something to do something, but the state is not set up for that any more than the church was set up to really be an administrator in the same way that a secular state is, you know, so the network is like a new Leviathan. Mm -hmm. And then network state refers to the fact that these leviathans are like, you know, almost like fundamental forces, and you can take fusions of them, and network state fuses the last two, right? So yeah. you can get a lot of the title. Go ahead. Yeah, no, there's there's certainly a million different launching off points. And I should say we're limiting this conversation to just twice as long as the conversation yes. you had with Lex Friedman. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, cool. but, I, you know, because we are heading into election you know, day in America here and uh, you're, you're, you're not located here currently, but you obviously have opinions about it. I just want to uh, turn to that one phrase that you said that one of the networks, you know, that was enforcement mechanisms of the past, in fact, mentioned by the founding fathers, in the Constitution was that this was a Constitution that was wholly unfit for a non-God fearing population. In other words, God, you know, fearing their nature was essential, even the ones that were deist or, or even atheist uh, of the right. founding fathers. And so they implemented something which would seem to be sort of uh, subjective and hard to implement in a purely cryptographic or, you know, chain based reality when you could do everything with 50.0000.1% you know uh, consensus and that was the electoral college and obviously there's lots of moves to get rid of that but that's you know wholly uh, you know it's effectively uh, meant to undo the tyranny of the majority and I, I guess I wonder you know is there is there room in a network state for those um, four different you know kind of concepts or previous concepts to still do useful work in other words uh, if you had a, you know, a, say a, a theocracy, you know, could it also tolerate a network state? And in other words, are they exclusive? Say the belief that held together civilization for thousands of years and instantiated laws between men and, and fellow men, are, is there room uh, for in such a uh, in such a concept as a network state uh, for God, or or maybe the revert, you know, the converse question, you know, if you have a state that is, uh, you know, uh, purely based on, uh, the, you know, some sort of notion of Ten Commandments, whatever you want is your moral code, is there room for, you know, another power to make these decisions uh, almost exclusively numerically, it would seem? So is there room for another power to make, like, political decisions? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, is no, this or... sort of replacement? I mean, if you, if you viewed it, uh, if you viewed the United States Constitution, as being, you know, suitable as the founding fathers said for only for a God fearing population, then, you know, uh, is, yeah, right. is the network state, you know, excluding God or, you know, vice versa? Oh, so it's not. Um, so in fact, you know, that's, uh, I have this concept in the book called the, the one commandment, which, um, you know, I, I do think that whatever you do, 
for a new community. I think it's, uh, I'm sympathetic to DAOs. I like DAOs, but mm -hmm. the big problem with a lot of DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations, they're not really autonomous and they're not really even that decentralized except right. for the location of the people. They often start with a token, they start with money, right? Yeah. And the problem with that is, have you ever seen Idiocracy? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Actually, Mike you know, Judge is a graduate, physics graduate of UC San Diego. Great. Okay. So <laughs> and I'm you know, going to have him on the podcast. He promised to come okay. on. <laughs> All right. Great. Well, so um, there's a there's a scene there where he's like, wow, you like money too? Me too. Right. <laughs> and, you know, the, the reason that's actually a great scene is it just emphasizes the fact that money is universal barter. It's yeah. universally valuable. And when it's universally valuable, then Clearly, it's not specifically something. I mean, everybody will be like, okay, yeah, I'll take 10 bucks, you know, no matter all their ideological differences or whatever, they'll basically 10 take some money. And so, what that means is a DAO can bring people in and, oh, wow, we've got 10,000 people in our Discord. Why are there 10,000 people in our Discord? Because they're just waiting for an airdrop. And they'll type it in a funny way when airdrop or something like that, right? right? And they're saying it kind of joking, but they're not. They're, yeah. The only reason that they're there is for the money. Right. They don't really have a shared belief. They're kind of, right? And so the problem is that while, you know, economics and money and so on, that's good, you have to have a belief structure first uh, the, of common values. Otherwise, there's many different ways that people can, like, scam or, you know, engage in low trust activity with each other if they don't think of themselves as part of basically the same group and they're, they're being something other than just this transaction at hand, right? They have to think of themselves as being an iterated game with the other person. And, uh, you know, just like, I mean, there's a thousand examples of this, but like, uh, you know, shrinkflation, mm -hmm. yep. what that is, right? Yeah. You know, you, he you like sell, adjustments. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're selling, I don't know, uh, milk, but you sell it for the same price and you call it, you know, uh, you know, milk, but you you just you make the container it has like uh less volume of liquid in it you know right, right? and same size box or, or yeah but but you yeah. get less less flu you know, mass <laughs> less mass in there and and you're just kind of you know you're sort of that, that's like a company which is um it's reducing the amount that you are getting for the same price but it's kind of tricking people into still buying it you know it's on the it's on the line right and there's a lot of that borderline stuff that happens if there isn't sort of shared values between the buyer and the seller. And this is for a thousand things. It's for, you know, it's for labor, it's for, you know, management, it's for a thousand things, right? So you kind of have to start, whether it's with uh, a shared belief in God, you certainly need a shared belief of some in something, you know? Mm -hmm. And, you know, historically, you could say the belief in God, well, that's like a decentralized and scalable enforcer. Why? Because someone who's a God-fearing man, you know, that, that old phrase, yeah. well, you know, even if there wasn't a state around to punish them, even if there wasn't a state, even if they were at the head of the state, if they feared God, well, they'd behave even when no one was watching them because, oh, you know, they might get hit by a lightning bolt or something like that, right? And so there's a, there's a rational sense in which you want an irrational actor who's a quote, God fearing person that behaves even when they cannot be punished or more generally, they b believe in something bigger than, you know, just the state itself. They, they behave well, even other than that. Right. That's right. And uh, so, so yeah, so in the book, I do talk about this one commandment concept, which is, you know, I, I'm not saying that every new startup society or aspiring network state needs to have its own 10 commandments, but you might be able to have one commandment, which is one moral critique of society that where you think your society is better and you kind of need that level of focus just like a startup company needs a product that is better than you know the existing marketplace on one very core dimension because it's very hard to improve on even one dimension you have to kill it on that dimension here you need a moral improvement on the on the uh on society at large and you say for example just give two examples cul-de-sac okay their uh, cul-de-sac.com, they're saying cars are bad, right? And so therefore, car-free neighborhood is good. Walkability is good. They start with those moral premises, okay? And from that, they derive the concept of let's build a car-free walkable neighborhood where the cars should push the boundary. A totally different concept is a KIFT, K-I-F-T, okay? Also a startup society. And they start with um, 
mobility is good, so van life is good. Okay, so cul-de-sac is walkability. I don't want to touch a car at all. Mm -hmm. Gift is a different thing, which is I want to be able to see this, you know, huge outdoors and travel and not be bound to one location. Therefore, I'm going to live in a car. I'm a city free life, not a car free life. Okay, I'm going to see the great outdoors and so on. What's funny is the same person might actually think, oh, both of these are pretty cool. But they're both mutually incompatible right. rejections of, you know, modern society, yet the COs are friendly, okay? And that's actually a pretty interesting thing where, of course, you couldn't combine car-free and living in a van at the same time, okay, uh, obviously. Still, you could imagine someone picking like, okay, I like a walkable neighborhood. I also like the concept of actually seeing this giant country that we're in and not just, you know, seeing it in, in picture books, actually going and bathing in a stream. And, you know, today I'm in Nevada and tomorrow I'm in Montana. That's actually pretty cool. I could just drive up there. Wow. Awesome. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, more generally, you could have, for example, a carnivore community where they only eat meat or a vegan community where they only eat vegetables and fruit mm -hmm. or whatever. And both of those would probably be healthier than the McDonald's community that is the default, mm -hmm. right? So essentially what I say in the book is that you do need a common belief. And I think that's abstracted by the way. That's not just like, you know, okay, biology, just saying something. That is a distillation of countless different communities that have been found in the past. And, uh, you know, one, one thing I quote is the, um, I think, uh, Sir Walter Raleigh and you know some of the early um, American communities. Uh, there's this historian Paul Johnson in an interview with uh, Charlie Rose, which I quote in the book. And uh, you know what what that historian observes is that the early American colonies that were for profit often just gave up in the winter, but those that had a religious belief continued through the tough winters. Just like those who are zealous about crypto continue through the tough crypto winters, right? It's somewhat mm -hmm. analogous. It's, it's kind of, you know, it's obviously a, something of a joke, but it's not completely a joke, right? You need something more than money to carry you forward when the money isn't there. You need to be irrational to achieve the the greatest results. Mm -hmm. Right. So I wonder in those uh, in those communities that you talked about, uh, if they would allow any any taxi cab numbers. And I wonder if you can uh, expound a little bit on your fascination with uh, one such taxi cab number, 1729. Uh, oh, yeah. And the context I want to, uh, uh, so I'd love to hear it in your own voice because you're such a, a champion of Ramanujan and uh, Titanic contributions. But I wonder, you know, in reading the book um, and coming to the end, it's, you know, essentially a love letter at the very end to him. Uh, but, um, but the centrality of math and, you know, math is, is sort of the, in some sense, the the most abstract. I mean, I, I always say you can't hand me a triangle. I mean, but the human mind can think about a triangle. You can't hand me infinity. We can think about infinity, but the level where you know we sort of meet uh, the instantiation of the network state. I think for the first time, it really would be at a base layer predicated on math, right? I mean, a lot of the um, operational behavior and the you know consensus and, and so forth, and obviously the monetary exchange would all be math-based. Um, and so it reminds me of, of this famous essay by Eugene Wigner, a famous physicist, mathematician, physicist, um, who spoke of the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the physical sciences, wondering why, for example, mm -hmm. you know, the square root of negative one, why that has any interplay with uh, with electromagnetic fields. Yeah. Right. Okay, yeah. Okay. Sure. Yes. And statistics, which from, which comes from the properties of the state, the mathematics of the state. That's the etymology of statistics, as you know. Um, that. You know, the classic key variable, key um, uh, feature metric of that is the normal distribution, which uh, describes populations as normal population. It has a number pi in it. Why, why does the ratio of the circle's circumference to its diameter play any role in the governance of a nation? So I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the centrality of math in the network states and the various configurations thereof. And, sure. uh, and, and maybe, maybe also along the way, we'll get into Ramanujan and why he's so important to you. Sure. Yeah. So on centrality math, you know, one thing you just mentioned earlier in the conversation is that, you know, the core thing about the network is Metcalf's law and certainly Metcalf's law, you know, network effect scales in square. That's, that's theoretically important. Two things though. First is depending on the actual network, 
uh, it's often, you know, much less than n squared. For example, that's number of potential connections, but you know, of the four billion people on Facebook, right. um, it's not like they're actually all literally connected directly to each other. Right. Um, there's, you know, some people have said it's like more like n log n or yeah, the small know, world like, approximation, right? Yeah, exactly. It's more like k times n or, or something like that in terms of the actual. And you could actually, yes. Facebook itself could graph this, and there's, there's a bunch of research on this. I haven't looked at the exact curve, but it's not exactly n squared. That's kind of right. one. Yep. The second thing is maybe deeper point related to the mathematics of it. I think for the network, the most important concept, the thing I think about the most is a very simple seeming thing, but that you can get a, very far with it. And that is the concept of the geodesic, graph geodesic distance versus the geographic distance. And uh, the geographic distance or the great circle distance is the distance between two points on the surface of the earth, like as the crow flies from one to the other, okay? Mm -hmm. And um, you know, you can you can think of that as, you know, plane flight distance. You can make a somewhat more complicated version where, you know, for example, South Africa and Argentina, you could easily fly from one to the other. But to walk from one to the other would have been difficult. So you had to go all the way around the Bering Strait and down, you know, the U.S., right? Like, right. I'm sure someone has done that ancestral, like, migration of humanity. Though humanity didn't come from South Africa, but you know what I mean? Like that huge walk across Asia or whatever, right? Maybe mm -hmm. it's possible in the in the thaw of the, you know, it's probably yeah. not possible anymore. You can't get land bridge, right? Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. land bridge. So um, point is, you know, whether you're talking about it as a crow flies or uh, how primitive man might walk, right? Um, or or surf or whatever, uh, that's that's like the physical distance in the world. And that's the distance that we're used to in terms of saying people are close or far or what have you. But the geodesic distance, the graph geodesic, is the number of uh, degrees of separation in a social network. And that's actually also a distance metric. And uh, in, in the technical sense, like, you know, D of... Uh, a comma B, and it's like non-negative, and you know it's it's got, it satisfies the triangle inequality and whatever. Um, and uh, the the graph geodesic, okay, um, that is something which is you can you can build a geography on it, you can build a topology on it. You uh, you basically have um, something where uh, you know that that shortest path distance between two nodes okay um it's like <clears throat> it's something that you can well first of all you can do a, a projection of a graph down into two dimensions and so you yeah. can make graph proximity in this relatively high dimensional space you can visualize it in two or three dimensions but second is it gives you a different intuition about how the space works for example a node can instantly connect to another node just by friending a bunch of people or it can instantly be very far away by blocking them yeah right that we know for like an individual that now extends to entire groups which we haven't really seen as much on the internet but a group mm -hmm. can suddenly become adjacent to another group by building a ton of connections there or it can suddenly break away from a group by you know cutting it it's as if every continent and nation in the world was on wheels Right. You know, one thing we sort of take for granted is Russia, the entity has kind of been in the same place and it has ancient geographical relationships, you know, with Turkey and with Eastern Europe and the Caucasus. And then also on its Asian boundary with, you know, I should say ancient, but they have, they have long standing relationships with Japan and China. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, the borders may expand and contract. And that means, you know, Ukraine is inside during the Soviet era and it's outside now. But essentially, Russia has been in the same place that we kind of take that for granted. By contrast, in the cloud with the geodesic distance, um, you can have, you know, Ethereum as this cluster and then Solana suddenly just appears next to it, <laughs> right? And it's competing with it or what have you, right? And then, uh, you know... An, Monero is there, and then Zcash just appears next to it, okay? And this is when you take a tech company, uh, and it's got some market, and then another tech company just appears next to it and is competing for that same market. Or then it just bows out of the market and it just disappears, okay? These are like large groups of people can just like materialize in space. The intuition is more like virtual reality where, kaboom, a bunch of people can just appear, and they can just disappear, 
Mm. Now that's digital. So the speed is instant, but it's a geography that's closer to our hunter gatherer ancestry where you're wandering around and suddenly boom, another tribe could just appear and you might be in competition right. or boom, it could leave. Right. This is just a totally different way of thinking about how states are organized and what have you, because fundamental assumptions about proximity and how governance is done, if the geography keeps changing, then you cannot assume that the geographical borders will remain constant. Yeah. If people can connect across borders, you cannot assume that governance within borders is necessarily the, the right thing. You know, as I was saying to like Lex, like, you know, you know what's order, older than borders is no borders. Right. Because you had hunter gatherers roaming the entire world. And there's that aspect of humanity that desires to travel the world and see everything and not be bound. And there's the other aspect that wants, you know, there's no place like home, right? That's right. a fundamental tension within humanity. And um, the math, I think, illustrates that where you start realizing the geography of the cloud is just very different than the geography of the land. You can teleport, you can be adjacent, you can be infinitely far with blocking, you can move groups nearby, you can move groups far away. It's, it's as if, you know, these clouds like would could float around and they're just much more dynamic and mobile and evanescent and so on than the geography of the land. So I think the metaphor actually, you know, of cloud and land, you can go pretty far with that. Go ahead. Mm. So um, thinking back, uh, just to close the loop on Ramanujan. So, um, oh, yes. Yep. I wanted to ask you, you know, first of all, there are two countries that were formed in 1947, 48, uh, Israel and India slash Pakistan. Yep. Um, what do you attribute the success of these two different populations? They figure prominently in the book, uh, you know, in one way or another, and some of the work and conversations that you had. Um what, what makes them so, you know, uh, either, you know, prototypical of good or bad aspects of potential network state uh, material? Um, and what do you attribute the success or the, um, you know, they, they far outnumber most, uh, you know, kind of ethnicities or nationalities, at least if you take, think of the Jews as a, as, a, as, as, you know, as a ethnicity only, but, you know, they, they, Indians and Jews do pretty well when it comes to Nobel Prizes, for example. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, you know, but uh, nobody's perfect, right? So, um, but, but tell me, <laughs> what do you attribute, uh, you know, this to? And, and what is Ramanujan specifically? I mean, he, he figures prominently in your thinking obviously and i don't think you've talked sure. as much about him specifically so what does he mean to you yeah first? yeah yeah so so uh, you know ramanujan um is as probably most people watching this know india's uh you know most famous mathematician and um you know had a very romantic life in the sense of you know tra tragic but you know like movie worthy and there's uh you know, you know, a book and a movie called The Man Who Knew Infinity and actually Good Will Hunting is based, yeah. I believe, in part on on his life. Yeah. And essentially was this mathematical genius that grew up in, you know, poverty in India. And um, then what happened was uh, he, you know, was able to figure out a big chunk of math on his own and wrote yeah. these letters to all these mathematicians, most of whom ignored him. But yeah. one guy, G.H. Hardy in the U.K., paid attention and basically airlifted uh, Ramanujan out and thus began just a rampage through math. And, you know, Ramanujan's notebooks today are still, um, you know, there's, there's, there's journals devoted just to them where yeah. he would just write down these formulas and then, you know, just with intuition, he'd get these, you know, equations right. Sometimes he had a proof, often he didn't, but quite often those, those amazing identities, somebody could prove them with a lot of effort, but he would just like, you know, spit it out like a neural network and may not be able to explain the process necessarily, but you could check them and they're very plausible. And um, unfortunately, he died very young. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when he on his deathbed, um, you know, the uh, Hardy was coming in to try to, you know, cheer him up and said, Oh, you know, there's this taxi cab that we came in on the license plate was very boring. It's number was 1729. And he said, No, it's the sum of two cubes in uh, it's the first number, it's the sum of two cubes in two different ways. It's one yeah. cube plus 12 cube plus equals nine cube plus 10 cube, right? Yeah. And that's kind of like what E equals MC squared is for, you know, the West and India, right? Mm -hmm. Like, because it's uh, it's just like this cool equation. I mean, it's, it's on the one hand kind of trivial, you know, once you know it, okay, you're just cubing numbers and summing them together. It's more that he was just on a first name basis with every number and could just like whip out this random identity, you know, when someone <laughs> asked him right about something, right? Right. And um, 
So, so that's actually something which is sort of symbolizes to me all of what I think of as the dark talent of the world. You know, just like the Hubble telescope, it's all about the dark matter, right? Yeah. There's all of this dark talent, which um, potentially is just languishing in obscurity. And just like we had the Hubble telescope, we now have the mobile telescope, and we can go and find all these people, and we can pull them out, and we can um, we can actually, you know, basically give them the opportunities that uh, both they deserve and that the world needs because we need more remarkings, yeah. right? We need mm -hmm. all this talent in, you know, uh, all these places that have just been kind of left out of the 20th century, the quote third world or what have you, or even the second world, you know, people under communist states, people in, in poor countries, uh, and now they're actually not so poor. Yeah. So, so this is something which, you know, has kind of a mathematical meaning, cultural meaning. It's, you know, it's obviously important for India, but it's important for the rest of the world. Um, and it's something that I think about a lot. I've thought about it for many years. And I think now the time is right to potentially go and um, in the remote first world, you know, try and find these next remonitions. Yeah. And I want to dovetail that. Um, first, by asking a question I asked Michael Saylor uh, almost two years ago now. And that was, what is the purpose of money? What What is the value of money? I, you know, I said to him, he's a, he's a bachelor. He has no kids, no, you know, no exes, no spouses of any kind. Uh, you know, he said he's, you know, his money is basically going to be for him and then he's going to save it up and then he's going to apply it to Sailor Academy and um, education and so forth. But I asked him, what's the purpose of money? You know, that's what you're going to do with it. Uh, but what's the purpose of it? And he basically said no, power and, and money is, you know, is basically stored up, you know, energy that can be, you know, displaced and used in a variety of ways. And I said, Michael, I hope you're not, you know, forming some like militia, you know, the sailor army. Well, he has a sailor army, you know, obviously, but but not of the violent kind. And may it always be like that. But what is it to you, biology? What, what is money do for you. I said to him, you know, like from uh, what Charlie Sheen's character said to Gordon Gecko and Wall Street, you know, the first version of it, he said, you know, how many yachts can you water ski behind? Uh, what does money mean to you uh, in contrast to Michael or, or any other uh, guests that I may have had on? Um, I think money is a tool, uh, not an end in its own right. Um, I have, you know, I, I have nothing against money, but mm -hmm. um, it's very much like a, it's a, it's an, it's an acquired, uh, skill that I've had in terms of, you know, I've very much started out as like a career academic and it's just, you know, doing, doing math for a long time and stats mm -hmm. and, you know, genomics and what have you. Um, I didn't really think, I didn't really care about money too much. Mm -hmm. Um, and I still don't really care about money. I made myself realize, okay, it's an important constraint that you need to use to get things. But there's some people who wake up in the morning and they go to sleep at night and all they're thinking about is how to increase their balance or what have you, right? Right. And um, instead, you know, really, uh, for, for example, let's say that you wanted to understand the genome, okay? If you get a grant of $50 million and each genome costs you $1,000 to sequence, that's a historic $1,000 genome price. This is yeah. like, you know, 10, 10 years ago. Well, you're limited to 50,000 genomes. But if you can figure out a business model that makes you even $100 per genome on net, you're now unlimited in the number of genomes you can sequence because each new one it adds to the uh, to your data set and um, you can just keep going, right? Mm -hmm. So if it turns out that you need to find a way to sequence a million genomes in order to understand human biology, that now by, by solving the money problem, you know, by solving the economics and figuring out a business model that can generate that data, you can now accumulate enough data to be able to diagnose and potentially eventually treat diseases, right? Yeah. That's the way that I kind of think about things. Um, that's what originally got me into, you know, one of the reasons, you know, that got me into actually, okay, let's build a business rather than just doing things in academia. Because business can scale, obviously, and an academic research paper is not meant to scale. It's so right. a limited study, limited study size, business is meant to potentially grow to infinity. And for those things that need large data sets to understand the world, you're, you're going to need that. And then you get into other aspects where um, if you want true independence, academic independence, well, um, if you believe that you have the skills to get, you know, tenure in, in, a, in the hard sciences at, at a university, you are overlapping with, it's not identical to, but it is overlapping with the skills required to become independently wealthy by, you know, your mid-30s or, or something like that. 
And if you, if you can do that, well, then you've got tenure in a different way, right? Tenure itself is like a illiquid asset where you can sort of trade it between universities and you can be tenured at X place and you can trade it for a tenure track at Y place or Z place. Relatively illiquid, but it's somewhat tradable. Whereas um, money, if you just had the runway for, uh, you know, 50 years of, you know, just being able to live without, you know, going and doing anything, you could just devote that to academics or open source software or what have you. That is in a sense, a kind of tenure. It is, a, it's an unbundled version where it doesn't come with the quote, you know, prestige of, you know, a legacy university or what have you, but it's more advantageous in other ways because that money is a negotiable asset. You can just chip a little thing off of it and then you can go and decide to go and do your open source work in the Bahamas, right? That's pretty nice, right? mm -hmm. you know, like on, on balance. And it doesn't have, necessarily have to be Lambos or whatever, but you can just go and code on the beach or be in a warm area or something like that, right? That, that's nice on the margins, right? You know, uh, you can hire a research assistant. You don't have to go and spend $20,000 or, or you don't have to like go and write a grant to get $20,000 or $50,000 for $100,000 even for a research assistant. You can just do it out of your own pocket, right? Um, so that's what money means to me is it's a tool to figure out, uh, to, to acquire knowledge eventually, um, even if there's a lot of indirections in between A and B. So why do you think that, you know, I made this statement, I had the opportunity to spend some time with Peter Thiel a couple of weeks ago, and um, I said to him, you know, a fact that I, you know, come across in my research, and and that was that, you know, there's basically no one who won the Nobel Prize in physics, at least, um, or even in economics, uh, died with a net worth substantially greater than, you know, his, unfortunately, most most of them, not unfortunately, but just a fact that most of the Nobel Prize winners are male, uh, only two living female Nobel Prize winners in physics. But, but anyway, none of them died. Einstein included. Charlie Towns invented the laser. Um, and, uh, you know, that uh, Shockley invented the transistor, uh, you know, they are responsible for you and I having this conversation, you know, a billion fold over, right? And they died basically with less, you know, net worth than their Nobel Prizes. Now, obviously, when I asked them, and I asked out your alma mater, Guido Imbens at Stanford, who won the Nobel Prize in economics last year, I asked them, you know, why, you know, why aren't there, why aren't all these Nobel laureates in economics billionaire, you know, multi-billionaires? Um, not connoting that, you know, the conflating rather the fact that, you know, money is, is the most important thing, but, you know, for someone who's professional, I mean, you made a comment a few minutes ago that, that, you know, you could, the, the skills are sort of fungible and that we could become, you know, a businessman or woman or whatever, become independently, but so few of us do it. Now, why is that? Um, is, is sort of the question to you. Why, why do the Nobel or why don't they, I mean, obviously Einstein, wanted to, to have more wealth and, and it goes back a long way. The tradition of, you know, wanting to not have a patron to have the FU money to do stuff on your own without having to take, you know, 65 diversity classes and, and anti-sexual harassment classes and so forth that we have to do and getting very little time to spend with our students in the laboratory. So why do so few of us do it? And why do so many physicists and Nobel prize economics, uh, you know, winners, why do they die poor, <laughs> you know, relatively speaking? Well, so first of all, I mean, it's just it's maybe an obvious point, but I'll poke at this a little bit. Uh, you know, depending on how you think about it, the point is not to die with a bunch of unspent money. Yeah. Right? No. Dr. I have Bill, you... Bill uh, Perkins, who wrote a book, Die With Zero, on. Uh, yeah. Two... <laughs> That's a great book. Right, right. It's so basically like, you know, you can't take it with you. Right. What you can do is, you know, do a few things. You can invest in longevity. You can invest in this concept I talked about in the Lex Friedman podcast, which we tweeted about, called genomic reincarnation. Briefly, if you believe that, you know, eukaryotic chromosome synthesis is going to be as feasible as microbial chromosome synthesis kind of, or, you know, already is prokaryotic chromosome synthesis already is, you might be able to sequence yourself and then reincarnate yourself in the future if somebody used that money to pay for that reincarnation and that synthesis in the future, okay? Uh, you can, So you can pay for life extension, you could pay for that, you could pay for cryonics like Hal Finney did. Um, you could certainly leave money to some somebody or something. And I, I don't have a good answer on that last part, by the way, in terms of what to leave the money to, because I think a lot of the foundations tend to get captured. Um, I think giving it to the government is a waste. Yeah. Um, you know, but I also think giving it to, uh, you know, people's children, I see all these, you know, generally, not always, of course, there's always exceptions. 
generally speaking, I find that many of these nepotists who've like inherited large amounts of money feel guilty about it. They have civilizational diabetes because if you haven't built, you feel guilt. Right. And actually, yeah, the, the Getty family, one of the scions or great grand, you know, children is now supportive of the, you know, uh, uh, let us uh, deface artworks and, and protest towards, you know, yes. Monet's and Van Gogh's. And this is to protest fossil fuel use, which is the only reason that anyone knows this person's name. Yeah, uh, and yeah. You know the point and, and, on the, the Lex Friedman podcast that actually resonates with the Yiddish proverb where the, you know, the out the, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the Zadie, the grandfather plants the tree. Uh, the the son raises the tree and then the grandson chops down the tree. Uh, yeah, sh shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. Three generations, exactly. Yeah. Was, yeah, that's right. And the thing about this is basically um, with something like that, uh, what's happening there frequently, and there's this documentary called Born Rich by I think the Johnson Johnson heir, mm -hmm. which is worth looking at. Yeah. Um, what's happening there is, I think, a few things. First is sometimes the people feel, I think, wrongly, but they feel guilt, not just that they didn't work hard, but, oh, my fortune was acquired in some ways, you know, illegitimately. Oh, my God. Right. But then they don't actually want to give up their fortune. Instead, they want to expiate their sins by making you pay for it. Right. Collective. Oh, fall, I made a billion dollars because I have a billion dollars because my great, great, whatever, you know, made a lot of money in oil. But I think oil is bad today because I've read some stupid propaganda. So therefore, uh, you know, what I mean by that is like, um, yes, I think nuclear is better. But like, you know, it, it's it, there's trade offs with everything. And like, uh, you know, you can you, you won't have a modern civilization without oil. You wouldn't have yeah. something to complain about with that, right? You, you can't make a solar panel without some oil processed along the yeah, way. Yeah, exactly. That's right. You know, like the turbines, you know, for wind or solar, like, first of all, they take up a huge amount of space as if you're seeing like a wind farm or solar installation. It's not like a it little can't be recycled, thing. energy. Right? Yep. Yeah, the density is just very low. And second is it's, you know, whatever. But the point is, um, these folks for, I think, bad reasons feel extremely guilty about oil. Um, and the way they expiate their sins is by making you pay. Right. <laughs> by the way, analogy, I think, and, you know, I don't think there's yeah. anything wrong with inheriting wealth. I think, you know, when you hear people, oh, I'd be rich as you if I inherited money, you know, to some lottery winner. Look how many lottery winners not only lose all their money, but like commit suicide or murder sure. or like it's actually very difficult for, for these scions or whatever to actually steward their money and, and then actually do something good with it. But as you're saying, yes. there is the guilt is a is a very powerful emotion, right? So it overwhelms yeah, so, us. Right. So the thing about inheritable, I mean, I'm not like, as I said, I, I don't have a good answer on this as of now. Yeah. Okay. I don't think it works to give it to a foundation often because that foundation will allocate in a bad way frequently. Ford Foundation, Rockefeller, Carnegie, not in my view, being really good in how mm -hmm. they allocate money. They become very, um, they, they just get, in, you know, entrained with the establishment, right? They are now... Um, they're just just allocated to the same yeah, stuff. It's, it's Nothing not unique. I mean, actually, the one thing that I do think is a pretty good kind of grant is like the Clay Math Millennium Prizes. Mm -hmm. That I actually think is pretty cool, right? Yeah. Um, that's hard to corrupt. It's genuinely benefiting all of humanity. The solutions to those math problems, if they're derived, easily worth a million dollars each. Um, and that's that's it's it's hard to corrupt and valuable through infinity um you know it's possible that maybe some open source thing or some smart contract that executed what your wishes could be as good yeah. possible but um but yeah so so with respect to to this uh i think that um why are we get on the topic of inherited wealth it was uh the jnj's or you know oh um, yeah so the gettys right so what happens is they expiate their sins by making you pay. There's something else which happens, which is when money is in abundance, then people want status. And when status is abundance, people want money, right? Mm -hmm. So when these folks are born rich, oh, they have all the money. Okay, well, now they want to be respected. Well, no one's going to respect them for just being an oil heir. Right. By, by taking a stand against oil, right. now suddenly, you know, oh, wow, the chattering classes say nice things about them. So they get positive feedback, right? So the social incentives drive it. Conversely, if status is in, uh, uh, you know, um, 
abundance. You want money. And this is like what I think David Brooks wrote about years ago. I think it's like uh, Megan McArdle has written about this status income dishomogamy, where you have a journalist who is palling around with all of these wealthy people. And, you know, they're in fact concerned about what they'll write, but then they go home to like a small apartment or something like that. And so status is much higher than their income. So what they do, they constantly write about how you know, we need to abolish billionaires and so on. Right. And the thing is, they're actually upper middle class, typically, or at least middle class. So in the top whatever percent of the world, certainly top 10%, maybe top oh, yeah. 5% of the, of the world. And when they say they want equality, they don't actually mean that they should be pulled down to global median income. What they mean is that tiny percent of 4% of people above them should be pulled down to them, <laughs> right? So by equality, they actually want ascendance, right? They actually want to level up. Once you realize that that's actually the goal, you can pitch something very different, which is the level up. And that is actually the difference where, you know, what the founder mentality is, is pitching essentially the personal level up, which allows them to transcend, which is actually the true goal. Very few people, quote, actually want equality, even if they purport to it. What they want is for those above them to be pulled down, not for themselves to be reduced to the global median. I mean, you've moved to, you know, out of America. So I do sure. feel like um, there what, what, will there ever be a scenario where you could see America being a good place for you to put your your resources, your talent, your time, and your money. Um, I mean, obviously, like this is a very complicated topic that's hard to produce to just a soundbite. But I think the yeah. short version is, I am have always been, and I'm still in favor of American values. Mm -hmm. Um. I think the particular American state and establishment has traduced those values broadly. And in particular, you know, the uh, I mean, the US was the un, undisputed hyperpower of 1991. With even moderately good management, you could have had probably a hundred years of peace and prosperity, you know, something like that, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what's happened is the U.S. establishment over the last 30 years has probably blown the biggest lead in human history. You know, San Francisco is being turned into like this, you know, open air drug den. Failed state. Um, yeah. Failed city. <laughs> failed city. I mean, to the north here. Failed, I, can, I can make failed fun of it. Yeah, exactly. It's happening and, and here, it's, too. I mean, in San Diego right. used to be the last bastion. Now there's uh, homeless camps that stretch for a uh, five square city blocks. And I, I've had the yes. mayor on my podcast. He's a Democrat, Todd Gloria. I've had Republicans on, and uh, it seems like there's just unwilling to really take on these these huge challenges, which, as you're saying, we have the resources. I mean, California is the fourth largest economy in the world now. Uh, it's not, it, yeah, it's not. It, in fact, actually, in some ways, it's the money is the bad part because many <laughs> yeah. poor countries around the world manage basic functional civil order. They have far less money. The money is not the constraint at all. It's actually the wrong belief system. Hmm. And it took me a while to understand what the heck was going on because – you know, with communism, at least I kind of understood it at the level of, okay, let's all gang up and rob this rich guy and have some ideological justification for that, right? Genghis Khan, but with an ideological overlay, you know, that's like Stalin, right? right? Um, so communism, at least I didn't, I didn't agree with it, but I understood it, okay? With, you know, the wokeness that has taken over these cities, I'm like, what political ideology would actually want to cover a, a city in feces, like that just seems negative sum for everybody. That that's yeah. not even like you know. Yeah, it's not communism at Yeah, communism at least marketed as zero sum. Okay, we mm -hmm. will all rise while we rob this rich guy. You know, who I see rich while we're. I I get that, even though I think it's bad because I think it's actually negative sum. What actually happens is the poor and the rich guy both end up in the gulag. You know, everybody mm -hmm. loses. You know, um. But with with what this is like, why do people want to like cover the streets and poop? That seems obviously the bad. Then I realized that actually. A lot of these activists, you know, and that's actually where it's a big part of what's driven by. They have this mental model that, oh, some captain of industry walks out of his high rise and he steps in poop. And now he understands the plight of those who he's normally pushed out of sight. If you notice when we talk about the homeless, you know, the um, these folks will say, oh, well, I'm so sorry. It's visible to you, huh? You know, as if it had just existed and. Uh, now it's suddenly being made visible to you, as opposed to what's actually happened, which is that uh, the provision of syringes and, quote, safe injection sites and so on has actually created 
a gigantic class of folks who are either drug abusers and or mentally ill and or uh, you know have some issue where you know the, you know you can you can decompose the quote homeless problem. The word doesn't actually encompass it. There's folks who are addicted to drugs. There's folks who are mentally ill. There's folks who are criminals. There's folks who just want to like you know live on the streets and just have you know a handout or or what have you. And then there's folks who are genuinely for every reason down on their luck and living in a car or a van. Um, but that last group is not the same as someone who will just you know poop on the street and smash somebody with a, with right. a brick different populations. Five. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's different populations. Right. And, and actually the term quote homeless conflates fair, you know, fairly different things. So, mm-hmm. so first of all, you're mislabeling it. The word is wrong because you think, Oh, that means we need to build more houses. Housing is not a cure for mental illness. Right. Okay. Girders are, you know, it, it's just, just totally different things. You're conflating two different things. And, um, the uh so, so so they just have the wrong concepts on this and you know once you realize that this activist is looking forward to this you know captive industry being humiliated and seeing the plight of the poor finally you realize that actually what these folks are doing is they're kind of using the homeless as native advertising in the following sense these uh, you know somebody's mentally ill is uh you know for example they attacked a woman in san francisco uh on camera right outside her apartment, like this crazy guy was not like letting her go inside. This immigrant woman was trying to get into her apartment. Do you remember this thing? It yeah. was like a few years ago, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and then uh, what, what is actually happening is, so that, that woman might, you know, survive. Fortunately, she survived this attack. She was, you know, I think relatively unharmed, but it was very scary. You know, she could have just been like dragged into the dark and who the heck knows, right? right. And so what might happen, I don't know her specifically, but what would happen is, okay, come around the next election, she would vote for somebody who promises to, quote, solve the homeless problem or address the homeless problem, right? And what does that mean? That means more budget to, quote, solve the homeless problem. And that actually means more budget for syringes and these billboards in San Francisco that say something like, um, you know, snort crack, but don't don't inject it. Right. Heroin. heroin. Right. <laughs> yeah. Say, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not even hold on. I'm going to get the exact billboard. Uh, San Francisco drug billboards. Right. Um, Can't go too hard. They might be a sponsor of the podcast. So please don't be too harsh on them. <laughs> okay. Sure. Fine. <laughs> so, so no overdose, right? Um, change it up. Uh, Injecting drugs carries the highest risk of overdose. So try smoking or snorting instead. Okay. And, and crop rotation. On, crop rotation. Yeah, they put these on buses. And of course, that you know, like this is marketed as being actually, you know, being real. Come on, man. Obviously, you know, it's naive to say people won't use drugs. So therefore, we just need to kind of meet reality where it is and so on. This is like the total opposite of people being like, you know, oh, okay. Uh, everyone's going to be racist, so therefore we just kind of need to meet reality where it is on this, right? So on some, uh, it's like saying like a wife, you know, her husband's going out of town, and she says, "Oh, you know, in case you cheat on me, please use a condom." I mean, you, you well, right? It's it's, it's it's basically it's something which is like, you know, they they are um, the what's actually happening, and this is a key step in this whole cycle that I had to realize that homeless industrial complex, when it gets budget, it increases the size of the homeless right. problem. So it's not a budget. See, right. Well, that's right. In fact, it's opposite. What happens is the number of quote activists and this homeless industrial complex has grown with the homeless population itself. So it's the feed the pigeon society. Look at all these pigeons. Oh my God. And they're actually creating the problem. They are exacerbating the problem and they are paid to exacerbate the problem. And they are paid to not understand that they're exacerbating the problem. They, whether you call it um, natural selection, I, I doubt it's like fully conscious. But their actions are making the problem worse, and right. therefore, if they care about right. I mean, mental illness is not going to be cured by you know uh, safe syringes and uh, and drug problems certainly won't yeah. be either. But it's like that's the band aid that you know covers up the uh, you know the the triangular knife blade scar, and and it's yeah. Uh, and, but do you, right. do you and, feel and, like a well? I have to. I have to. Add, I mean, would such analogous things happen in a truly you know networked state, and then? You know, again, getting back to the question, like, what would it take to return your business back to California? I mean, to be crude about it. Uh, I don't know. I mean, like, 
What's it, what does it take to return your business back to Detroit? What does it take to return your business back to like that? What, how about bring it back to Greece or Rome? You know, <laughs> like I, I think yeah. that that era in civilization is over. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not like, uh, I shouldn't suppose that you're not happy where you are. I, I I'm yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry if I'm no, saying no, I understand. I understand what you're saying. I mean, I can give a recipe. I'll come, I'll come to that in a second. Yeah. One thing I want to say also is basically if you, you know, one of the things that's recently finally been kind of featured in the press is like, the mothers of these drug addicts, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, like mother of addict slams, you know, San Francisco open air drug policies. Basically, these mothers are seeing that their kids who were borderline, their addiction is being enabled yeah. by this homeless industrial complex, right? So that is actually the angle where you can see this is not compassionate. No. It's actually zombifying a previously functional human being in the name of, quote, compassion, but it's actually you know, turning somebody into a dependent when they could have potentially stood on their own feet and been independent with a different, you know, form of intervention. That's this right. is very similar to how these, these NGOs, this nonprofit industrial complex, you know, they want to be these uh, saviors in Africa and India and so on and so forth. And really, investment is independence and charity is dependence. Like Easterly and Levine have written about, you know, stopping the aid and so on, because the aid is basically something which is meant to give the person who's quote giving it out a good feeling, yeah. right? But it's all the whole, you know, teach a man to fish versus yeah, exactly. give a man. Jesus, fish, Jesus right? said this 2000 years ago, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, well, right. Okay. So I actually had, you know, and, uh, but if you also look, you know, there's this uh, article by Priceonomics, which is about the, um, the most effective development program in human history. Have you heard this one? No. Is it the U S army or something? <laughs> No, it's actually Nigeria's most effective development plan in human history was just a business plan competition. Oh, really? Guess what? Wealth creation. Basically, the thing is, you know, you can do, I've talked about this before, but if you've got a rich guy, okay, they can do one of two things. They can say, I'm giving out grants or I'm, I'm making investments, right? If you're giving out grants for a nonprofit or for individuals, what will you get? You're going to get a queue of people who are each competing to be the most pathetic or sympathetic, right? Yeah. In extremists, you know, this is like Slumdog Millionaire, where they chop off the limbs of this poor beggar to make them more sympathetic. Okay, there's actually like learned helplessness. They actually self a harm in a sense, either cycle right. They make themselves out to be they real. They think of themselves as being as harmed as possible, right? And you actually see this in, um, you know, there's the the tech insta brag versus the woke insta sag. What is the insta sag? It's basically I'm, you know. Uh, autistic, disabled, the, X, Y, and maximal Z, intersectionality, you know, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, maximum intersectionality. I'm the maximum victim. I have established that I am at the absolute bottom. Therefore, you need to put me at the absolute top, right? The powerful victim, right? Yeah. So, basically, because they're at the absolute bottom, they win the status competition, right? They are now at the top of the queue for the grant because they're the most pathetic and they're the most deserving. How could you possibly give somebody else some money? And this is a learned helplessness to win the game that's being set up. And what happens is of 100 people who are in the queue for that grant, uh, maybe one person quote, wins by being the most pathetic. They really go all in. They're the method actor, you know, so to speak, right? And the other 99 make themselves weaker in the process. They think, you know, they think of them, woe is me. They rend their garments, right? Et cetera. Right. By, con by contrast, when folks are competing for an investment, rather than the woke insta sag, you have the tech insta brag. The insta brag is like, you know, I uh, graduated MIT in physics in three years, and I, you know, had my first start at this, and you know, we got to one mil rev, and we sold it to this, right? And often, what you'll Exit. find is the the same person, okay, who's like a you know talented college graduate, will unconsciously talk about all of their victimhood on in one context and then talk about what a killer they are in a different context and they'll make that you know, you know what i'm saying right yeah no I've, I've had that you know for the scenario where it's like you know uh you know i've 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 come to you know here and, and now my amex points are you know they're not transferable to the delta lounge and i'm like wait a second i, I thought you were like you know this long suffering uh you know yeah uh, right think, well but, but actually but though even more than that it's not like yes that's the fact that they're upper middle class but the um, the thing is that in order to get an investment, right? Like in tech, there's this sort of insta brag, you know, five second intro that people will use at parties or whatever. It's not actually. It, it's just like um, it's something which is, oh, he he, you know, I don't know he uh, he's a core contributor to jQuery, 
or oh, it's like uh, on Tinder yeah, they, they pose and their Rolex is showing. Or, yeah, there's, there's like well, well, so that's founder, Stanford you, grad. You know, I mean, that's thing is so you're so I think there's a very important difference here. Yeah. You're bringing it back to their frequent flyer lounge or their Rolex, and it's not really about the display of wealth. That's actually not what it is. It is the display of competence. First ten employees at Stripe. Uh, mm. It is the you know um, this this I I I. I was a core contributor to jQuery. It is a technical or- YC, yeah, YC class. Yeah, ex exactly. That's right. Insofar as money is quoted, it is, we got the company to a 10 million valuation and it was acquired by Facebook or whatever, you know, like 100 million dollars is acquired, right? And so it's not that, oh, I have a Rolex. Nobody respects that. That right. that That's like, Gaudy, you know, that's right. it. Huh? Go ahead. It's gaudy, yeah. It's it's it's, it's gaudy, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like I would say, I shouldn't say nobody respect. I'm sure they do on like Tinder. That. I'm told that you know are, they have to have some way of differentiating the three guys that are going to get the competing maybe for the, you know one girl, that, right? That, <laughs> that that may be the case, right? But it's also like you know who are you going to attract with that or whatever? Yeah, fine, right. you know. But let's say let's say that there's 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 maybe something to that. Point is, um, that the, so what I'm what I'm talking about though here is, uh, the the inst instant kind of demonstration of victimhood status versus the instant demonstration of victor status. Like I'm, I'm like, I am the most convincing victim and I'm the most convincing victor. Right. Those are the two different things, right? <laughs> Where you've got a hundred people that are competing for this VC investment or angel investment. And each person is just straining, you know, be like, close one more deal, right? Ship one more feature, you know, improve the design just a bit to kind of pip the other one and get that investment, right? Now, what happens in that that context? Yeah, just like it's like a it's like a hundred people running a four hundred meter dash. Okay, it's true, only one wins, but the other right. ninety nine, their cardiovascular fitness is improved in the process, right? These folks competing for that investment, that one investment of a hundred thousand dollars makes ninety nine people stronger, right? They become better at building, better at designing. Even if they don't win this time, they become overall as wealth creating for the community, right? Right, and that's why this. You know, if you actually, the, the true charity is investment because you're investing in their independence. I mean, another way to see this, by the way, is like, um, if, if you're walking down the street and uh, let's say someone makes 100000 a year, okay, and they see somebody, you know, like uh, uh, who's just down on their luck. Okay, if you give them 10 bucks, right? Someone might give them 10 bucks. Now that's ten thousand dollars, ten dollars, and uh, nine ninety nine thousand nine hundred nine dollars for for the for the person walking down the street. That person walking down the street, how though, is very unlikely to give that you know guy a thousand dollars, let alone fifty thousand dollars, and actually make them equal, right? right. Um, and uh, so so that person may doesn't actually want equality. If if they were giving thirty thousand, forty thousand dollars, they're like, wait a second, I earned this money. Why am I giving it away? That immediately kicks in once it's beyond just like a, oh, I feel sorry for you. Here's a, here's a few coins. Right, right. Yeah. That's why you'll have Sheryl Sandberg have a press release for giving a million dollars to the ACLU, which is you know point zero 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 one percent of her well, net worth. Yeah. So, so 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 what's what's but here's what's happening is um, what people are doing with that consciously or unconsciously is sometimes they're assuaging guilt. Sometimes if it's a public donation like that, they're buying status. Yeah. But what happens is charity decelerates, right? That is to say, the closer you get to income equality, the more that person rises, the less the money comes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which means charity never actually attains equality. You know, if that person's at zero, you might give them ten, right? But if that person even had 10,000 or 20,000, if they were like working class and on their feet, you wouldn't, you know, people wouldn't give them, you know, 10 bucks. They'd say, okay, you know, you're on your feet, go, go, right? By contrast, with investment, uh, you know, this is a very famous example. There's many, many, you know, millions of not famous examples. When Peter Thiel invested in Zuck, Zuck was much less wealthy than him. Now Zuck is much wealthier than him, but both of them benefited in the process, right? Yeah. That's like putting $10,000 into somebody. Now they're worth a million dollars. At least until last week. I mean, Peter said he's off the board and then Meta has crashed, which we're going to get to because I do want to get there. Okay, your... sure. Uh, <laughs> po point being that basically with yeah. investment, you're actually incentivized to make them richer than you. Yeah. And with charity, you're not, right? Mm -hmm. Charity, in, for, in order for it to continue, they have to be poorer than you. They have to be right. in a dependent role, et cetera, right? So, so a huge part of this stuff is, in my view, a combination of gaining status while having a crew of dependents, it's yeah. the same process that, that that was run 
overseas in many of these quote, third world countries to keep people dependent that's now being run in American cities. Now you might, you said, what, what, what would be, yeah. what would have to change to come back to California? Uh, you know, I, I, I gave a, again, I think of this as highly implausible, but you know, let's just uh, do it for the, the, um, exercise. the mental exercise, mm -hmm. right? Um, I, you know, someone asked me about this with like the chips thing. Um, yeah. And, and I was like, you know, cause I, I was like, you can't ban your way to number one. Okay, this is this recent thing. We said, you know, and it's like how to become number one in tech. Okay, here's some obvious points for STEM education, not math is white supremacy. For technology, you know, like a pro tech culture, not lol tech bro, right? For skilled immigration, not like multi hundred day visa delays for like basic things. You know, you can't even get like a B one or whatever to come to you. Yeah, H one B. Yeah. No, no, but actually different. H one B is like a permanent work visa. A yeah. B one is just like a visitor visa. Right. Uh, so that itself, there's 100 day delays to attend a conference. You're not even trying to immigrate to attend a conference is a huge pain. Right. Mm -hmm. um, pro wealth creation, not abolish billionaires. Right. Pro civilization, not what's happening in San Francisco. Right. And I, I, I think, unfortunately, I mean, civilizations have like a like a heartbeat, you know, and in different ways, like China and India and other civilizations are like on the rise. And like, like blue America is just. In some fundamental ways, on the decline. In some ways, they're still actually they've got something. I mean, what do I actually think happens? It's possible. This is the somewhat dystopian outcome, and that's somewhat very dystopian outcome, which is, you know, San Francisco actually hasn't been pushed to the limit of what it could be. If you take it to the limit, you have a few engineers coding AI in their rooms with you know DoorDash being delivered, and outside a you know sea of fatherless drug addicted zombies that you know these ngos are getting addicted on syringes like how far can you push that right, right. san francisco is like running the experiment of like a, you know like basically turning a previously functional city into shanty towns and a few tech people right i don't think the tech people are causing that no. i think they managed to survive despite that i think it's the ngos i think it's the government the state that is causing that but the tech people are indirectly subsidizing it by being present and by paying. They are themselves enabling the enablers, right? They're by living in San Francisco, you are voting for more San Francisco. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. Like, no matter what you quote vote for, you're actually enabling it by actually physically being there and contributing to it. And so if you want less of it, you, 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 you know, it's only words if you cast some vote or something like that. Truly, you know, symbolizing it is going somewhere else and doing what our ancestors did and moving, you know, and, 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 you know, whether it's, you think of it as the frontier, whether you think of it as moving in search of a better life, whether you think of it as voting with your feet or protest vote, there's many different ways of thinking about that, but really it is moving on from something that really has failed partly because it was so rich, you know, they, they got so rich that they, they could just do anything and the money would keep rolling in. They didn't have a connection between cause and effect. Now they're finally seeing it with people going to Miami. That's the only thing that's giving them some degree of correction, right? Is that exit. Nothing right, else it, actually. As you say, as long as they're the number four economy in the world here. and That's momentum. Thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that's momentum. And I think, I don't know. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Go ahead. No. Uh, yeah. So I was I'm not say, saying I mean, it's going to zero overnight, but I am saying that it's definitely no longer. The, the crucial thing is it, it, it no longer has power in a fundamental sense like microsoft 2022 is wealthier than microsoft 2000 but it's far less powerful yeah. it's no longer a choke point on the whole tech industry right mm -hmm. and you do not need to come to silicon valley to raise money you don't need to come there to incorporate a company you don't need it for, you know sand hill is just less relevant for example a6 and z that's why they've gone full remote they've gone full cloud like tech is global it's decentralized thankfully in a sense we've decentralized opportunity i mean that's the flip side of this now if you're in manila or you know you're in um, you know the you know South America uh, or the Middle East or the Midwest. You've got as as much uh, opportunity as if you're in the middle of Sand Hill, and that's awesome, right? So there's a huge benefit to not having everything centralized, concentrated, quote unequal, et cetera, in California, in Silicon Valley. I mean, what a risk for the technology industry to be in the worst governed city, in the worst governed state in the world. Right, relative to its wealth, it's like the worst, worst governed, and the wealth is what enables that. It's like 
giving a ton of money to this heir who just puts it up their nose, right? That's what San Francisco is. You know? And yeah, we're doing, you know, we're giving rebates and gas inflation, you know, bonuses uh, sending out yeah. uh, here in California because we uh, obviously have too much money. I mean, my favorite statistic is the Na the NASA budget, you know, for all of 2020 is lower than the Los Angeles Unified School District budget. And you look mm -hmm. at how much NASA does and it's just, just incredible. Well, and you think the like, solution is just obvious. It's not throwing more money at it. It's getting people that actually care about it going, what do they do in another country? I mean, don't they go to school year round. I mean, I get paid a very handsome salary by the state of California. I'm not complaining. I'm a state employee. Gavin Newsom is my ultimate boss, right? I shouldn't speak too much <laughs> about it. It's true, uh, but, I guess. So. But the point right. is, you know, uh, you know, I would be doing this job even if I didn't get paid. I, I, I love it so much. I love being a scientist. I love working with people. Uh, it doesn't mean it couldn't be, you know, infinitely better. And I wonder, you know, you, you mentioned this. A lot of what I'm seeing nowadays is kind of this nexus around uh, colleges. I'm coming to think of, you know, ironically, my profession is sort of, you know, one of the STEM causes for for some of these challenges. I mean, the ideologies that come out. I mean, what sure, you're yes. explaining in the in the you know kind of extrapolation of the end of you know in modern history, maybe the Fujiyama's kind of tortured right. saying. Uh, but 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 more than that is is sort of like, well, what's next? Is like, is China inevitably going to become like you know woke San Francisco if they continue on this? Is it like an inevitable hmm. dialectic of history? Uh, but I see all these ideas originate in the university system, and and those those come from you know the, the pattern of of basically the old world. I mean, the most uh, you know Humboldt and and the uh, and the institutions of of Germany that educated the first PhDs in America, uh, and now you know kind of doctor all you know doctors of education, et cetera, that set public right. school policies. And now we have you know like my kids go to school you know nine months of the year. Why is that? I mean, like do they not have stuff to do? I read a statistic that actually the biggest discrepancy between you know disadvantaged economically disadvantaged kids. And non-disadvantaged kids, which sometimes, you know, unfortunately is a proxy for black and white or minorities or whatever. Um, I don't want to get into that, but but the study disaggregates by that. Anyway, the biggest difference is that the, the wealthier kids do something over the summer. In other words, they're not idle for three months during the summer. They're going, they're doing something, even if it's going to a water park, they're interacting, they're solving problems, they're doing some kind of thing out of the house. Um, and then obviously it's best to have some kind of enrichment program, but the poor kids don't have that. And it'd be so obvious, like just keep school open at uh, 12 months of the year. Why, why should a, a, a public art teacher you know, be tenured in the state of California, you know, in a, in a, in a school? What, what do they need tenure for? Academic freedom? Are, are they doing research that, that is so on the cutting edge? I don't even think I need tenure. I should get your opinion right. about academia. First of all, well, so, okay. Yeah, go so, ahead. I mean, yeah, there's a ton I could say in academia, but we, so- I'll give the very quick version. I've talked about this at length in yeah. you know various other podcasts, uh, but I'll, I'll paste in a link at the end. Um, short version is independent replication over procedure citation. Um, essentially, what's happened is academia has mistaken the form for the substance. The entire infrastructure of NSF and NIH and universities and journals and so on is just you know, a superstructure on top of the fundamental, I mean, it's, it's got a few different origins, but this, I'm just taking the, the STEM part of it. Um, all of that is a superstructure on one person telling another person how to replicate an experiment. That's actually all that truly matters. If you cannot independently replicate the experiment, it's not science. Mm -hmm. It may be published in a scientific journal. It may yeah. look like we think of it with the academic affiliations. It may have the form. But if the data isn't available, if the protocol isn't available, if the methods are not independently replicable, it's not actually science. If you cannot replicate, it's not science. That's right. That actually kills a huge amount of stuff, which is talked about as science, right? Yeah. And in fact, it also allows you to rank papers. You know, everyone talks about citations. H index. Factor. Which yeah. is invented yeah. here at UCSD, by the way, my colleague Jorge Hirsch. Yeah. And there's something, you know, the thing is, it's an e interesting proxy variable. Like, you know, yeah. not actually what you want to what you want to do is you want to rank papers or more generally ideas by the number of replications, not the number of citations. Max Illustrations has trillions and trillions of replications. Some paper that came out in Science or Nature last week, you know, that purports to be, this is how, you know, this virus works or whatever, that right. has like probably zero replications. And we're not tracking the number of replications. That's way more important than the number of citations. But and, once we do the, you know, the pushback respectfully, I mean, once you yeah. get the Higgs boson mass, it's not like, oh, we have to do it 65 trillion times 
you know, again and again, uh, that doesn't add incremental surprise or entry, you know, reduce I entropy. I don't know about that. And the reason is because, um, for example, think about, let me give a different, think about code, okay? When you have a um, piece of software, you are effectively, it's not simply a paper, you are replicating the results because you're running it again locally millions of times. And in doing that, what do you find? Well, you'll first of all, you'll find it doesn't work on this platform or that platform. But you'll also start servicing one in a thousand or one in a million bugs, which uh, you know, in doing it a few times, you might not have seen them, but you on you surface race conditions, you know, threads that are competing with each other, rare things that arise under odd circumstances. And by just replicating it tons of times, you find that kind of stuff, right? And um, I do think that if you've got just something which is true on the basis of one ex expensive experiment, you don't really know how true it is. It is sure. only if you can just do it over and over again, and you've reduced it not just to a science, but to an engineering, that you can then think of it, you know, if it, it's flaky science in the sense of it, it kind of works, kind of doesn't, it's like, you know, you have to get the instrumentation just so and hold it just so versus something that's highly robust, then it's not a subroutine that you can use for something else. You know, like the light doesn't just flick on and you can just assume it's going to work. Right. Mm -hmm. So I actually do think much more emphasis on replication. And this is, it's not unique to me. Of course, people talk about the reproducibility crisis in many areas, but that's like one thing I think is rotten at the core. I think, I mean, there's so many, so much more of it. I mean, basically you asked, will China become like a, you know, woke San Francisco? They actually had their opium period already. Yeah. Right? That's true. <laughs> our, future, our futures are past, right? Like yeah. it is now America's time to have its own quote, you know, fentanyl wars or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I think part of it is with the, uh, you know, so, some comments on these. Um, if you, if you've just been born to number one and you haven't done what it takes to remain number one, people think being number one is their birthright. And I wrote this article and it's called founding versus inheriting. You know, the people who are especially running the U S establishment now, are like the third or fifth generation heirs of a factory that cranks out widgets. And, you know, they have the name and they legitimately inherit it. Okay. They've gone through the process to do this, but they're completely incapable of changing the factory to crank out something different or innovate on it. Right. These are not people who could organize the U S military from scratch. Everybody who had any talent to found has been drained out of the U S establishment into tech. And so what that means is you have folks who are selected, adversely selected. They're the folks who are often less quantitative or they're less good with budgets or numbers. And those are the folks who remain in the US establishment with everybody else going into tech. And then what happens there is it's not the typical theory of comparative advantage. You know why? Uh, it's like the Peter principle, right? You know, like rising to their level of incompetence and they happen to master yeah. that domain. <laughs> yes, it is that. But it's also something where it's like, if if I'm making apples and you're making oranges, fine. I can take it or leave it. If you're right, right. if I'm making Apple computers, and this person is making governance, right. that is not a trade I can refuse. Right. right? Mm -hmm. So basically, comparative advantage does not work if you're outsourcing your governance to others. Uh, this is a fundamental. You see what I'm saying, right? Yeah. So this is a fundamental issue where there's no gains from trade. There's huge losses from trade. We have left the government of the United States, the establishment of the United States, to these kleptocratic incompetence, and all the folks who can add. I mean, you can you can see this where you know uh, a while back there was this uh, clip on uh, I think let me get it right. It was uh, Brian Williams and Mara Gay. Okay, so um, where they. Uh, <laughs> He's talking about like Brian a trillion, Williams. like what are the population of America is like a trillion people or something. Yeah, it was, it was, I mean, it was like, uh, right, you know, right, oh, Bloomberg right. could give a million dollars per U.S. resident, yeah. and they flashed a tweet. It was such a ludicrous thing where they flashed a tweet on screen that said, uh, you know, that Bloomberg could give every American a million dollars, and they just, it wasn't just that they got it wrong on screen. It was that they didn't have any sense. They couldn't just do basic long division. Yeah. They couldn't, there, there's no sanity check there. Um, they really thought of rich people as being so much richer than they actually are. They, uh, The entire production staff for the, for this media outlet didn't have the most basic contact with reality. 
And that actually is a, di it's like a, you know what a dye test is, D-Y-E? Like uh, no. Or a smoke test. Sometimes you'll take some dye and you'll kind of put it through a system and you'll just see. If oh yeah, like an exhaust system, see if there's a leak or something. Right? See if there's a leak, right? So this is sort of like you're tracking something through a system. You're seeing these people can't add, multiply, subtract, or divide. Okay. <laughs> but they so have blue check marks. They got blue check marks. Yeah. They have verbal they have ability status. and they can act. They, they have can act. They, yeah. yeah, exactly. They have verbal ability and they have status so they can act, but they cannot add. Yeah. And so it is like Dr. Nick, you know, in The Simpsons, he plays, yeah. uh, you know, a doctor on TV, right? Right. And so for these people to make policy recommendations, policy equals budget. Budget involves division. And, you know, forget about NPV and talking about like, a, you know, that's not even like that advanced math. You can't even divide, you know, a million bucks. Um, or, you know, divide properly to figure right. out that, that Bloomberg. But do you think it's that it's not numbers? appealing? Like, yeah, I was uh, noting that there's basically no governor, no senator, all these hotly contested, you know, races and stuff and backed by this billionaire. That, and like, there's not one race in the whole country where anyone's brought up science and technology. They haven't even brought it up. Yeah. Right? A governor. They, and, uh, it's insane. They, and, and, but, and, and the number of like scientists in any government around the world, I, I think it's pitifully low. I know there's like one or two physicists and, um, but, but I also wanted to ask you, you know, when you think about, you know, governing of, uh, of a country or, or something like that, uh, I've done a video that's, you know, knowledge is not equal to wisdom. And, and I've had, I've interviewed 14 Nobel prize winners on this podcast. And I'm always trying to see, you know, if a sufficient amount of knowledge can actually be converted into wisdom. And I'm not, I haven't come to any sort of conclusion about it, but I guess the question that I that I have is, you know, who would you want to run a country? And I guess in your case, maybe you're saying, you know, the people run it, but, but I mean, isn't that oh, well, the kind so, of Churchill quote that the people, you know, get the government to deserve and they deserve to get it good and hard? Well, so first, by the way, one thing I want to say is, um, if, if you look at the, 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 I mentioned this example of the math errors and so on. Yeah. Look at this other yeah. you know, tweet that I linked there, the Lorena yeah. Gonzalez one. Okay. Uh -huh. Yep. She was replying to Mike Solana, who's a, you know, VC associate at, at Founders Fund. Yeah. Or VP at Founders Fund. Rather. And she's like, serious question. How does it feel to be a billionaire while promoting companies that leave workers in poverty? Do you feel ever feel bad about the massive income inequality? It's not every day that a billionaire engages me on Twitter. They just think of billionaire as being a big number, right? Yeah. This is the same as when Bernie Sanders like that's where she saying, lives, by the way, biology is where she lives in San Diego. Yeah. No. Okay. Great. So, you know, of course, Mike Solana is like, well, thank you very much. I don't even know if Mike Solana has a million dollars. Like Mike Solana is a great guy, he's a smart guy. He works at FF, but he's not Peter Thiel, right? Right. And what you realize is, oh, these people don't understand what billion means. And then you realize, wait a second, of course, they're listening to Bernie. And Bernie right. is saying millionaires and billionaires. Right. And as if they're like, saying they're a thousand fa times different. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like saying meters and kilometers. Right. Right? Meters and kilometers. Right. Like that's these NBA thousand. players are so tall, they're meters and kilometers tall. Right. right. And you know, the number of the ratio of millionaires, I mean, like there's like, I don't know, depending on how you count, it's like uh it certainly on the order of five to 10%, uh, last I saw, I may be wrong on this stat, but it's a non-trivial number of people, if you include house or whatever, that have over a million net worth in the US. Whereas billionaires is like a few thousand in the world. It's a much, much different thing. Correct. So you realize, so that's like three examples, like Brian Williams and Mara Gay, that's Lorena Gonzalez, that's Bernie Sanders. They don't actually know what a billion is. Like, mm -hmm. forget everything else. You know, you're, we're talking about, you know what FizzBuzz is? Uh, no. FizzBuzz is a very basic, you know, programming uh, question, okay, which you ask candidates, okay, and it's like, um, let me, you know, let me get the, it's it's basically like print the numbers from one to a hundred, um, and uh, for each multiple of three, print fizz instead of the number, and ah. for each multiple of five, print buzz, buzz and uh, you know, if it's if it's a multiple of three and five, print fizzbuzz. I think that's basically. Um, the the thing, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, this is not this is not like rocket surgery, okay? <laughs> not brain surgery. It's not rocket science, right? That's right. Um, I mean, that's you know, for effect. Uh, it is. It's like you know, you, you understand. Yeah. Basically, division, right? You you do right. a for loop, right? And uh, and many people cannot pass this. 
Right. Like well, they've done tests. Uh, Kahneman did a test with you know Princeton seniors on you know if a uh, te- factory makes five widgets in five hours or whatever, you know how many yeah. does a hundred make in a hundred hours? You know, they could so, get so, half so, of that so, wrong. Yeah. So the question you're asking of oh why don't they talk about science and technology? They don't know what a billion is. And they, also, they their counterpart. She's the same woman. You know what else she's famous for? This our our lovely Congress Assembly woman here. In- oh, the one that said "f you" to Elon Musk. Yeah, and he said "message." Yeah, exactly. Helped drive up a hundred million right. dollar company and left. Yeah, that's right. So, like, it basically, costs- these folks are. I mean, they. It's it's like so, the question of why don't they understand the implications of artificial intelligence and VR and cryptocurrency and you mm-hmm. know whatever. That's just so far beyond. We're talking like it's in a different galaxy. These people cannot do fizzbuzz. Like right. you can't overestimate. The problem is, by the way, they're verbal and they can act. And so they can give the facade of competence. Yeah. But if you actually gave them a basic test of math, they would recoil like garlic. This is actually why, by the way, including even a single equation in anything you're writing. Yeah, makes them, cuts it in half, right? Cuts the readership. Well, out. well, actually, what it does, it, yes, yeah, so that's a, that's the conventionalism. Every equation cuts your audience stuff. But what it actually does is, it makes a certain kind of very, you know, confident political actor recoil in fear because it's like having Chinese characters in the essay. They don't necessarily understand it. So they're like, oh, okay, you know, I, I'm I'm kind of right. So I went to Paris once and, and I went to the waiter and I, I took, you know, one year of, of of high school French, but I was with a woman, American woman who had lived there for 30 years and she was only like 40. She spoke a I mean you couldn't even tell. The waiter comes up and asks for our order. She orders in French. The waiter says, it's okay, madame, you can speak American to me. I said, oh yeah? Well, I would take to the six of those four costs. The guy's like, oh, he couldn't run it out. It's like, okay, well, you want to play that game? We can play that game. You know, there's <laughs> there's no problem. But if you probe them, it's like the old joke, you know, like uh, on the surface, they're deep, but deep down, they're superficial. And I think, yeah, yeah, they're yeah. They're smart. Right. They're right. Right. They're so dummies. They, they, to get to a level of competency in any field, let alone to, you know, master this, this game, it's not like they hand it out. Uh, you can make well, fun of right. uh, so, okay. so well, he's a community organizer. He's a very gifted human being, very intelligent. But does that mean wise? Not necessarily. So, well, right. So here's the thing. To give a little bit to these, you know, enumerates, right? Um, it is actually the case that uh, <laughs> just you actually, that. when they have the Simpsons, they have the, the council of elders or whatever. And they're like, well, we have to get uh, Skinner says, you know, we have to give the sub of megalodo- megalodoids or whatever, you know, some <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> Sorry, yeah, yeah. Ahead, yeah. Right. So, so um, just, just in a, like the time we have left, yeah. basically it actually is true that in addition to be able to being able to do the math, you also need the skills of a political leader and or, you know, actor or what have you, right? Or influencer, better way of thinking about it. And so someone like Elon actually does have both skills, yeah. right? He can do the math, but he can also convince. And so that's actually what you need is you can't just say, oh, you know, we wish that charismaless engineers would run the country. You yeah. need charisma, charismatic engineers, right, to, to run the country. Yeah. And how do you actually, you know, do that? Other, others, you're not going to build anything. But yeah. how do you do that? Well, they have to be able to found. And how they found, well, that's the network state. So we come back to that, yeah. right? And you cannot complain, you know, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, I was just going to say in the last the last couple of minutes, I think, yeah, persuasion, salesmanship, it's a dirty word, but actually it's incredibly important and to be to have persuasive ability to right. do so. There's sort of a seductive element. Robert Green has talked about this. Um, uh, so I know you only have a couple of minutes. Uh, maybe someday we'll get to do a part two, but I just want to comment one last thing on the the dark side of networks, you know, I'm always using it to encourage people to have big families, you know, using Metcalf's law, the the kind of, uh, you know, benefits of, of having multiple children is that now sure, they're friends Brian, with each Brian other. Brian Kaplan's book and so on on this. Yeah, yeah. So they'll, yeah. they'll be friends with each other. And then when you're dead, the parents are dead, then at least the kid's relationship will be sustained. And also, it's not like you need a new house if you add a kid, but you add on, you know, maybe it might double the, the size of the network and you know, the happiness might scale with the number you know, squared and the, and the cost might scale is N. So, but what, there's always a dark side, right? There's always a node that can go rogue or couldn't go bad or, you know, the niece of Osama bin Laden who was using Instagram that, you know, led them to get his DNA for whatever. There, there's always some element of risk in the network. And I'm reminded of a, another Yiddish kind of story where there's a, a rabbi and, and he's uh, he's in town and one of his congregants says some uh, evil speech about him. In Hebrew, we call it Lachan Hara, evil speech. And tell some gossip, which is true. It's not a lie. It's true about him, whatever it is. 
And, uh, and then he feels really bad. Yom Kippur comes along. He wants to repent. He says to the rabbi, rabbi, how can I make it up to you? Rabbi says, okay, my, 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 uh, my friend, uh, just get me a feather pillow. Gets him a feather pillow. Great. What's next? He goes, uh, cut the feather pillow open. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, I can do that. Am I, am I forgiven? Uh, no, no, there's, there's one last thing as the wind is swirling around. Go pick up all the feathers. What are the risks inherent in a network state, not just the upside, which you've categorized so nicely? In the sure, book. sure. I mean, what, what most people will come to, what most will say is, oh, my God, you're so unrealistic. It's never going to work, et cetera, et cetera. And they'll say, oh, in particular, what people always come back to uh, is um, use of force. Uh, oh, you know, you and what army? Where's the military? You know, you don't have nukes, blah, blah. And, uh, you know, there's a long and short answer to that. Go ahead. What? No, I'm just laughing. You have know, nukes. So that would be a good thing in the, nowadays, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Well, well, the thing is, it's it's basically something where they're not actually, they're just sort of reacting at the surface level on something. If, right. You know, the, the reason the internet was invented in part, you know, like DARPA funded it for yeah. something that- it was nuclear conflict, right? That, exactly. That's right. That's resistant to, and, and we might actually need to go back to that future- where in the event that Putin or whatever sets off a nuke and the nuclear taboo is broken, you may want to have governance structures that are nuke resistant, right? And you can't nuke a network. How would you nuke Bitcoin? That, that actually is something where, what, you're going to nuke uh, uh, billions of people that you don't even know where they are. You need to have an XY location and they need to be implicitly concentrated in one physical location. If you're distributed, that's actually something that makes nuclear weapons less useful. Right. It's only if you're sessile and fixed to a location and you have a lot of fixed structures and so on and so forth. And, and if people know where your location is. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, a, there's there's a lot of things where folks haven't really thought about what it, just like we talked about earlier, the the cloud geography versus land geography. People have not thought about what actually security looks like in an environment where people are highly mobile, where capital is mobile, where you can encrypt things where you can distribute and decentralize things. It's not to say that force goes away, but force looks a lot more like drones than nukes, mm -hmm. you know, and a lot lot more like, you know, special ops than huge armies, right? And uh, it's much more surgical and it's tweezers and it's, you know, scalpels, it's not sledgehammers, right? And so they haven't thought about what force looks like in a network world. That's not to say that the, that no sledgehammers exist. There's still obviously huge sledgehammers being deployed in Ukraine and back and forth. But a lot of that is actually also still cloud war. It's also network war. You know, Ukraine wouldn't be where it is without being able to wage a really effective cloud war against you know Russia's traditional kind of land war. Um, so I think you know you asked what the downsides are. Um, I mean, that's one downside is is just that I think, uh, which is not exactly what you're asking, but one downside is folks will try to map this to the things that they've already seen without thinking about how technology has changed things. It's a little bit like cryptocurrency, a lot like cryptocurrency, where um, it, it would, you know, some people get it right away. And for some people, they just have to kind of see it working for a while. So one downside is you just have to make it work before people believe it, but that's fine. I mean, you, that, the critical thing is for something like this, you don't have to convince everybody. You just have to convince enough people that you can get a small percent. Only a small percentage of people, for example, move to the US. That changed the world. You didn't get the majority of people to move to the US. You didn't even get 10% of the world to move to the US. Only 4% of the world is in the US. And many of those were born for folks who moved there, right? So a tiny percentage moving to the frontier can change everything. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, the quote, lack of majority appeal or what have you, you know, is actually, is it bad? It's actually good in some ways, right? So that's that's kind of my my quick answer in that. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. All right. I know you have to go. I appreciate your time. And uh, maybe uh, we'll do a part two someday, maybe in person. If I ever get where you are, you come back to Long Island. We'll, we'll meet up in Ronkonkoma. How about that, Biology? Ronkonkoma. There you go. <laughs> meet me in Montauk. Montauk. <laughs> Montauk. Right, yeah, that's even better. East Hampton. All right. Bye, thank friend. you. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye.